celebration of the literary arts here in Saskatchewan. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome our guest, Trevor Harriet. Now, Trevor is a prairie naturalist and award-winning author of six books. Most recently, Islands of Grass, with the photographs of Branavir Jetvi. Now, Trevor is a recipient of the Cheryl and Henry Kloppenberg Award for Literary Excellence. Trevor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me here, Danica. Well, I'm really pleased to have you here. We don't get guests from Regina very often in the studio, so, <laughs> so thank you so much for, for staying on this morning. And, oh, it and worked out well, doing the reading last night and staying over, yeah. So we're, we're going to start talking about Islands of Grass, because that's, that's the newest book. That mm -hmm. one's been nominated for, for Saskatchewan Book Awards this year. Mm -hmm. So tell me a little bit about the, the background of, of this book. Okay, well, I think I've always wanted to do a book with photographs, but my photos aren't very good. Um, and there are a few good grassland photographers in the province, but uh, I knew Branimir Jetvai because he's also an activist and uh, a defender of grassland. And so I'd met him a few years before this, and we just slowly started talking. I don't even remember who it was, if it was Branimir or me, but we started talking about doing a book together probably in 2013 or so. And by 2015, we had made a commitment to go out and do the research together. And uh, although he had lots of photos in store, he wanted to take some fresh ones, and I wanted him to get some ones that would kind of fit with the essays and the stories that I was planning to write. Uh, so we did a lot of traveling in that summer of 2015, and uh, and then we got sidetracked because we ran into a story about one community pasture, where there was uh, a story of uh, the decolon or the, the colonization of an area and, and and the removal of indigenous people, and that just sort of knocked the wind out of me for a while. And I because up till then I was thinking all these community pasture stories are so great, you know, we're protecting these community pastures and the history of the pastures is so so rich. And then you see this kind of a dark episode, which made it a, a different book opportunity. So I started, I asked Brian if I could set aside this book, Islands of Grass, and, and write a little book, which I eventually wrote uh, and was published by um, the University of Regina Press uh, a year and a half ago. And it's called Toward a Prairie Atonement. And, Branimir is actually in the book <laughs> off and on because he's still there taking the pictures, right, as we were doing the work for this book. So it's interesting, the, the two books kind of, I was writing the two of them together in a, in a sense. Yeah. And the stories flow back and forth <clears throat> though, and, and there's the, the underlying themes that flow back and forth from Very one, much one so. book to the yeah. other. Yeah. Now, would you like to read us a little, a little sure. segment from the book? Sure. Um, this is uh, from the opening of the book where I've uh, just tried to get introduced to the, the notion of public ownership of land versus private ownership and the effects on grassland because of that, because we've lost 80% of our native prairie in the province and a lot of that, almost all of that, is on, is on private land. The public lands we share are the last of the commons that reflect at least the potential of honoring the spirit of our treaties. When governments privatize them, even as they check off their duty to consult obligations, they're perpetuating and updating the colonial abrogation of treaties. Indigenous people lose their access to traditional lands overnight, eroding their already limited opportunities to experience the world that puts metaphor and meaning into their stories and language. Public policy, meanwhile, loses its capacity, admittedly underemployed to date, to ensure that the land will be managed not merely for private economic gain, but for biodiversity and traditional use of biological resources by Indigenous people. The national grasslands, leased rangeland, community pastures and reserve and tribal grasslands on both sides of the 49th parallel should be treasured as the jewels that they are, as centers of natural beauty, cultural renewal, carbon sequestration, biodiversity, sustainable agriculture, research and learning. For that to happen though, people who do not own cattle will need more places where they're welcome to walk and experience the prairie without having to drive five or ten hours to our one and only national park in the grassland biome. People will defend and speak for places that they know, rivers where they fish, coastlines where they swim and camp, a forest where they hike. Not enough of us, indigenous or settler, get out to see large expanses of native prairie these days. Those who live in prairie cities and many of those living on farms have never heard the song of a sprague's pippet, never watched a ferruginous hawk circle into the clouds, never, share, never shared a hilltop with pronghorn antelope. Yeah. So has that been, um, uh, that part of the province that, that we're not as familiar with, has that always been something that you've been familiar with? Well, you know, I think of it as the whole province, the, the southern half of the province, below the, the boreal forest, but most of it we've sacrificed for 
you know, intensive agriculture production. But that area in the southwest where the largest remnants of grass are, uh, I started visiting there uh, when I just became interested in birds and natural history because I knew that there were certain birds that were down there. And so I would travel down to the Cypress Hill, Hills area and south of there, uh, around Grasslands National Park, the landscapes that became Grasslands National Park, Frenchman River Valley, and uh, just, just to see what, what big pieces of grassland look like, to find the birds there. I think of the birds, <clears throat> I've mentioned this often in other books, as being the, the only real remnant of the ecological integrity and the beauty that was there in the grassland. Because with the bison and the plains grizzly and the plains wolves all gone from the landscape, and then removing the indigenous people from the landscape uh, 120, 130 years ago, we've utterly changed the way the ecosystem functions and the way people lived in harmony with it. And so when you, when you think about the writing of this book and the stories that you collected, do you have, uh, and, and obviously the, the story of, um, of <coughs> that became Towards a Prairie Atonement mm -hmm. really was something you mu that must have been a surprise to you. Were there other things that surprised you when you, when you started exploring some of these areas? with the intent of <coughs> collecting those stories for a book? I guess what was most interesting to me, perhaps surprising, was just the, the complexity of the human relationship to grassland. Because, of course, our ranching communities you know, have a long-standing cultural tradition there of their own now, because they've been there for four generations or more. You know, Some of them since the 1880s, 1890s, their families have been on the same pieces of land in that, in that region. And, uh, they think of themselves as being as belonging to that landscape, <clears throat> and when you speak to them, you see, you know, and you hear great respect from them and uh, an intense willingness to uh, to live there on the terms of the land. Um, and so that's always impressed me. But on the other hand, we all, we know that there are so many other issues around conservation and the way the land is used because ranching culture hasn't been kind to certain species, right? You know, rattlesnakes, for example, the swift fox was poisoned out by ranching cultures. And then we have to consider that before then, there was a much longer standing tradition of indigenous people living there and they were all forcibly removed in the 1880s by the Johnny MacDonald government, as we learned in James Daschuk's book, Clearing the Plains. You know, they were all moved north to areas around North Battleford. There are people living now in the North Battleford area, indigenous people whose ancestors had that kind of connectedness to the native prairie in that, in that region, and that bond has been more or less broken. They would like to restore it in some ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so um, what, kind of, uh, what kind of audience have you found so far for this book? Well, <clears throat> of course, you know, I'm mostly writing uh, for people who are already thinking about these things. Um, uh, I hope that there are a number of rural people as well as urban people who, who are reading Branimer and my, my book here. Um, but uh, it's, hard, it's hard to say. When you go out to readings, of course, it's almost always settler people, you know. They're the folks who, you know, we, our literary community is all established for a settler culture. It's just the way it is. The publishing world is, uh, is set up really for settler culture. So. You know, it's, it's the, the same audiences, uh, uh, I guess, but we're always hoping to find new people who are, haven't come across these ideas. I mean, one of the main reasons Branham and I really wanted to do the book was to try to open people's hearts and minds up to the richness in, in history and in ecology, the diversity that's down there, the, to wake them up to that with some beautiful images mm -hmm. and some stories. Well, and, and sometimes in this day and age, people need pictures and, and yeah. short stories in order yeah. to grab their attention. And this book does a really mm -hmm. wonderful job of that with stunningly beautiful photographs mm -hmm. so, and, and, and words that match. So it's, uh, it's really a, a wonderful. I think sometimes when we, when we take a risk to do something a little bit differently than just putting text on the page, we do open ourselves up to new audiences who might just yeah. the judge a book by its cover type of book, bookstore. Right. Browser. There are people who, who may not want to read this book but they'll read this one. Right, and I've got other books that are also about grassland. I've got one on grassland birds. You know, so that covered off people who are really keen on, on the birds in the world. Um, so I'm going at this from different angles. Now I'm writing a novel, which has some of the very same themes, although it's on a wider kind of a national scale of how we settled Western Canada and how that's, that rela relationship to the land has been altered over time. 
using birds once again because uh, it, I follow a historic character, William Spreadborough, who was a bird collector in the 19th century on his travels through all of Western Canada, all the way to Haida Gwaii and uh, all through the prairie. And, and then try to bring it up to date with a, interleaving it with a modern narrative of, of somebody who's doing kind of similar work but with, without collecting the birds, just doing um, bird atlas work here in the 21st century. So trying different ways to open people's minds and hearts up uh, to the importance of, you know, of all of our landscapes, but certainly the one where I live here, it's, it's our native grasslands and our wetlands that we are increasingly uh, eroding and degrading. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks, Trevor. That's all we have time for today. All right. So thanks, thank Danica. You, thank you so much for being on the show. I'm Danica Lohr, and this is Lit Happens. Thank you for watching. You can find past episodes by going to Shaw TV Saskatoon on YouTube. You can find me on Facebook or Twitter, and you can contact me at DanicaLohr at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you.